like dance? No, I don't. Come on, hey, buddy. Listen, sit the fuck down. I wouldn't talk to you, alright, buddy? Hey, buddy, why don't you go fuck yourself? Excuse me. I have a fucking problem with me. I don't have a problem, do you? I mean, just forget about it, man. Hey, when I, I don't want any step trouble. outside, can I don't want any conversation trouble. out there. I don't want any problem. Right? Just stay back, right? I don't want to fight this guy. You got that? So what's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong. I just don't want to fight him. Just stay back. Fuck you. <laughs> So, you want to win a street fight. Let me disappoint you for the first time, and I'll disappoint you several more times. Nobody wins a street fight. Real life fighting is not like the movies. Real life fighting involves severe physical, emotional, and legal consequences. That doesn't mean you should become a victim. So I'm going to help you see how some people prey on your weakness and try to make you a victim. Then I'm going to show you how to stop them with your mind and your mouth. If that fails, I'm going to show you how to legally use physical force to stop them. The moment of truth belongs to you and you alone. You must rely on yourself. Let's prepare for the moment of truth. Let the one who desires peace prepare for war. Men are at war with each other because each man is at war with himself. Tell you what 50 years on planet Earth has shown me, and some of that was as a bouncer when I saw plenty of physical violence and all the different kinds of people there are in this world. For one thing, I'm nice to people. I never say something like, fuck you. Because you know how some people respond? Well, they'll respond like this. <laughs> no, fuck you. Most of the fights I encounter generally uh, originate over money women and property most of the time. Uh, they, they begin with uh, uh, words and generally escalate from there. The more serious fights escalate from, from hands, fists and feet to weapons of a varying variety from, from bottles to sticks to knives to guns. Bars are, are uh, extremely conducive to violent behavior. Uh, think about what goes on in a bar. Uh, most people are consuming alcoholic beverages. So, uh, alcohol is probably one of the number one facilitators of aggressive behavior. That if someone is drunk, they're more likely to respond to provocation, and actually they're more likely to go beyond that response to provocation. Or it could be drugs, because drugs do some phenomenal things to a person's mind. Maybe it's alcohol and drugs. Women, I'm not sure. Maybe a lack of women. But I say there are good reasons to fight. Self-defense is one. Self-defense means that you're going to fight back when somebody's trying to victimize you. There are a lot of people out there who enjoy controlling, manipulating, and dominating other people. And those people fight for all the wrong reasons. Men's hatred generally springs from fear and envy. Somebody will always be jealous about something that you got. And you may, may not mean them no harm in the world, but they don't look at it like that. They may look at it, I mean, we're talking about the whole you know, jealousy or that uh, you know, the individual is, is looking for, you know, you remind them of some, something that they would like to be. Uh, and so you, certainly they may take that out on you, yeah. I mean, that may serve as an aggressive factor, yeah. In my experience, I think the, the bully mentality is driven by someone with a self-esteem problem. They, they fancy themselves a tough guy, so they're going to try to prove it to everyone around them. They, uh, for whatever reason, need the good feeling that they get from beating somebody up, be it in a bar or anywhere else. The bully is somebody who uh, has learned at a very young age that if I want to get my way, aggression is one way to do so. Either you are in control of yourself or someone else is. Some people, when they hurt, they take it out on themselves through drug and alcohol abuse. But other people try to take it out on you. You need to understand how the bully operates so you can be a few steps ahead of him. He controls you because you're not in control of yourself. He manipulates you because you're not aware of his tactics. And he dominates you 
because you're not willing and able to fight back. Wars frequently begin 10 years before the first shot is fired. A fight starts way before blows are struck. If you wait for that point, it might be too late for you. And you might be the one laying on the ground bleeding by the time you realize the fight is on. Any coward can fight the battle when he's sure of winning. You can pretty much know when a guy is up to something by the way he, the hand motions, arm motions, the way he moves, if he keep watching you, you know, start watching him, because he's up to something. Most predators stalk their prey several times before they attack. The interview is when he finds out if you're a good potential victim. The interview is the verbal berating and challenges and threats that the bully makes prior to his actually making a physical attack. Dude, you're being a fucking punk, man, standing over here just staring at Why does he do this? He does this for one reason, because he knows from experience that most people are not prepared to deal with direct stand-up in-your-face aggression, and that it freezes them up, it makes them choke, and that makes them an easier victim for the punch-out. That's what the interview is all about. Your best defense, self-defense-wise, is awareness and alertness. Be immediately aware when the interview has first started. What the fuck you been staring at me for, man? What? what? It may be obvious, like, what the fuck are you looking at? Or it may be more subtle and earlier. The hard eyes across the bar room. Don't ignore it. Ignoring it won't work. Don't ignore it because he won't go away. He will take your trying to ignore him as denial and fear, and then he'll escalate to the next phase of the program. The interview is meant to paralyze you with fear and denial, to make you a safer victim to attack, and to make sure, that is to identify for the assailant, that you're not the wrong person to fuck with, that is, a dog that bites. <laughs> If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not to fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you succumb in every battle. There, there are always ch a chance that you can get took off. You, you never know. I mean, if you're not aware of your surroundings, then you're a dead man. To be aware is to be alive. If you look at life like a warrior, you must be aware of yourself, your potential enemies, and the battlefield. The first level of awareness is to be aware of yourself. That is the most difficult part, to be truly honest with yourself and find out what all your weaknesses are. This is what your enemy feeds on. The second level of awareness is to get to know the people around you. Learn to walk in their shoes. Don't look at life through your eyes. Try to see life from their point of view, and you learn how they think. The last level of awareness is to be neither you nor your enemy. Just fly above it all and see how everything operates as a whole. To be aware like that is to be truly alive. Good fences make good neighbors. If you're not aware, your enemies will control, manipulate, and dominate you. If you have holes in your armor, everything they throw at you will get in. You must build strong boundaries, not only for fighting, but using your daily life. You begin to see why people say things to you to get to you. If you keep giving away information to the wrong people, they're going to use that against you. It's not what people say to you, it's what they mean by it that you should be looking for. We're now going to talk about three types of boundaries. First, physical boundaries are going to let your potential attacker know he cannot sneak up on you. Second, emotional boundaries will shield you from his lies and manipulation attempts. And finally, legal boundaries will hopefully, and I stress the word hopefully, justify your use of force. Harsh necessity and the newness of my kingdom force me to do such things as to guard my frontiers everywhere. Physical boundaries, most of us like to have uh, personal space, uh, that being three to four feet thereabouts. And so 
You know, when that personal space is violated, like if you're in a crowd, for example, people like to have some space between me and somebody else, and if you're pushing up against me, that's going to make me very uncomfortable. Okay, first thing we need to do is establish physical boundaries. You don't want to let somebody get in your face and have an opportunity to hit you, take you down, stab you, shoot you, whatever they're going to do. So here's how it happens. Man, why do you keep looking at me? Huh? Huh? Hey. Why do you keep looking hey. at me? You stay right there. Keep your man, distance. Why are you getting defensive? I'm just asking you Relax. a simple question, we man. We can talk from here. All right. So here's what happens over here. The guy gets in your face. First thing you're going to do is step back and say, buddy, I don't want any trouble. I don't want you to get any closer. Let's talk about this. But you don't want this guy to be close enough to you. You want him away, at least two arms length. We have the long range boundary. So this is usually the best distance to be in. All right. Then we have the short range boundary, which sometimes I don't know what this guy is doing. The music is too loud. So what I usually do from here, I check one arm and check the shoulder. Because I have, I have pretty much control of the situation over here. Let's say he says, fuck you or something. I said, fuck you, man. Okay. This is a fighting position over here. Now, what I'm doing is sneaking it in. Same thing, I'm still stepping back, dividing my weight, have good base. But I don't have a fist going, saying, let's go. Here, same thing. See, I can still throw all my strikes from here. I'm ready to go from here, but it doesn't look offensive. It doesn't look like I'm the aggressor. From over here, he can charge and punch. I can meet him halfway with my own counterattack. Or let's say he wants to take me down. I already have enough distance over here to stop him. Okay, so I'm going to keep this boundary at all times. And this guy, if he comes after me, He's walking into my trap. I'm not gonna rush you. I'm gonna let you come to me. I'm gonna let you come to me. And when you come to me, that's gonna be your first mistake. Cause I already know what I'm gonna do once you get in the range that I need you to be in. Do not underestimate the power of evil, thinking it will not affect you. Dripping water can fill a pitcher drop by drop. A fool is filled with evil, even if it accumulates it little by little. With regard to emotional boundaries, if people are, uh, if you're being insults are being hurled at you, you know, shove it up your ass. You know, people react negatively to that. That if you're being provoked in that fashion, it's just as though you're being physically provoked. I believe in evil, so I say, don't listen to the devil's words. What ass? Your faggot ass. I still can't hear you. Hey, hit Fuck him. off. Hit him. Some people can see right through you, especially good predators. The way you look the way you feel, the way you behave, but especially the way you react to what they're saying to you gives you away. If you let them into your head, they'll poison your mind with fear and doubt. Fuck off, man. What the fuck is what? wrong with you? Hey, fuck you. This is your physical boundary. Now you have another boundary, which is your emotional boundary. Don't let anybody in. Man, fuck you, man. Come on. You want to fight, man? Fuck you, get your ass over here, man. You being some kind of fucking pussy? Come on, man, you gonna let people see you being a pussy like this? Self-defense is nature's eldest law. They attacked me, I told them to stop. And I don't know, the guy with the knife, and I thought he was gonna kill me. That's what we talk about when we say imminent fear. And that means simply that a person whose conduct makes it clear that they are going to hurt you, that they are going to assault you, gives you the opportunity to use whatever force is necessary to protect you. Now the really difficult part of this is you have to be able to explain. You have to be able to articulate what it was you saw, what it was that person did, and what you believed was going to happen. I thought he was going to kill me. That, if articulated properly, will justify your use of force. I don't know what's going on. In the event that you can't fully articulate that, if you can't say why, if you can only say as the victim, this was an instinct I had, and you might be on some thin ice when explaining this to the prosecuting authorities. Now, it's important to note that the self-defense concept that we're talking about is a defense that's used in the courts, and the definition we're talking about is one that's given to a jury. So keep in mind, if you're in a point where self-defense as a definition is something you're talking a lot about, then you've gotten to the point where you've been charged. One of the things I recommend is make it clear in your own statements that are said loud enough for all potential witnesses to hear 
that you think the person presents a threat and that you're asking the person to back off or withdraw. Right, I don't want to fight this guy. You got that? So if you make that statement loud enough, if you make it clear enough so that everyone around heard you, it is going to provide you a great deal of protection when the police come and interview these witnesses. Because one of the first things they're going to say is, tell me what you heard and tell me what you saw. Yeah, I did. That gentleman over there in the black coat, he said he didn't want any trouble around here or anything. And If the only thing they ever heard you say was, back off. And uh, he stood up and said, you know, I'm here trying to have a good time. I, I don't want a part of this. Don't come any closer. And said, you know, I, I don't want to start anything. Those sorts of statements which indicate that you are trying to avoid a problem, that's going to be a great deal of protection for you and can avoid a lot of problems down the road. You have prepared your legal defense from the testimony of others. Then your only problem is, if he does attack, is dispatching your man. I tell you, that's a lot easier to deal with, in my experience, than the legal system. Eventually, one, one or three things is going to happen. You may run up on a guy that only fucks you up real bad. Or you may run up on a guy that kills you. Or you may run up on a guy and kill him. And then you'll be in a penitentiary with somebody that's tougher than you. I'm going to give you some good reasons to de-escalate the fight. Maybe you don't want to die. Maybe you don't want to kill anyone. Maybe you don't have a whole lot of money to fight the legal machine. And most definitely, you don't want to end up in prison. Always remember one thing. The winner walks away and brags about it. The loser never forgets. Just because you won the battle doesn't mean that you won the war. The escalation is for your own benefit. You don't have to be honest about it. You can give your attacker a little taste of his own control, domination, and manipulation. Bottom line is, you just never know who you're messing with. told me in the penitentiary a long time ago that a fool will run into a bigger fool and he'll take care of that problem. The supreme excellence is not to win a hundred victories and a hundred battles. The supreme excellence is to subdue the armies of your enemies without even having to fight them. I, I think if, uh, if, for example, an individual such as a bully or anybody, if they see fear in the victim, they're more likely to uh, continue on that line, primarily because in the past, uh, you know, childhood, adolescence, if they've seen that, that usually suggests that person is going to give in or is an easy target. And so if you stand your ground, you're less likely to get those sort of actions. Show no fear. That's not the same as feeling no fear. Show no fear. Someone not giving in to their threats, their physical threat, anyone that could stand up to them will immediately make them back down, in my experience. Okay, we already have our physical boundaries, we have emotional boundaries, and we have legal boundaries. Now we're ready to start de-escalating this fight. And there are several ways we can do this. I, I think, it's an I thing. If you can look me dead in my eyes and not take your eyes off me without blinking, I'm, I will start to think to myself, I might have a couple of problems with him. What's up, man? How you doing? How you doing? We'll on Scott, stage. nice to meet you. You guys having a good time? Hey, what's up? I introduce myself, or I just let him know I know what he's up to. I know he's looking at me. I know where he's going next. I'm out. trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, everybody else is, right? Oh, yeah, that's what we do around here. I like to see you. Have Take care, one. man. Have, Have a good one. one. See you around. And I just want him to know that I'm aware that he's looking at me and where he's going. If you can empathize with them, uh, if you can talk to them, 
if you can introduce humor, for example, it's a wonderful way, in incompatible response. If that person's angry and frustrated, if you can do something that's opposite of that. Hey man, do you have a problem? No problem, man. What's your problem, man? Hey man, I'm Chris. Hey, nice to meet you. I'm Dave, man. Just had a really bad day, man. What's up? Ah, I just didn't like the way you were looking at me from over there, and I thought you had a problem with me, but... No, not you know, at all. Not if at everything's all, good, then it was nice to meet you. someone else. Pleasure to meet you. You too, man. Bullies are very insecure. They need some reassurance. So tell him he's good looking, big, tough. Yeah, sometimes I like to kick a little ass. Yeah, oh. that's true. I think you guys were tough though, man. You don't want to hurt people out there, right? I mean, look at you, you guys work out and shit, don't uh, you? You know, once in a while I try to get to the gym when I can. Right. <laughs> Please just don't hurt me, right? It's all right, you're cool, man. That's cool. Yeah. If you can make them aware of some of the inhibiting factors in the environment, you know, some of the things that if they were to aggress could serve, you know, if they, they can get arrested, if, if uh, you have friends that are with you. And so uh, if you can make them aware of that, that might serve to reduce aggression. Hey, you know, if you want to get a little fun tonight, I can always go kick someone's ass out there. Definitely. You guys don't want to do that. I know all the cops around here, man. They're bad news. Don't worry about it. I'll go for you, man. They'll take you guys to jail. You don't want to be there. You don't want to do that. When I was outside of my bar work and I was being the object of the interview, I would sometimes use the crazy man approach. Here's an example. The guy says, what the fuck are you looking at? And I would respond like this, not responding immediately at first, like I wasn't all that interested. Eh, eh, eh. we're from the same neck of the woods. Now, most people, even the Apache Indians, didn't want to fuck with crazy people. It's when I go into prisons and interview convicts and killers, and I ask, who's the guy here who's not connected, who nobody really wants to fuck with? It's always the same guy. It's not the person who's killed the most people. It's not the people who stabbed the many people in the prison. It's always the crazy guy. Nobody wants to fuck with the crazy guy. Hey, buddy, why don't you go fuck yourself? Fuck myself. You guys like that? This is crazy, man. Oh, shit. Jeez. You want to see crazy? You no, I'm fine. Man. I don't want to see crazy. Man. It's all right, man. It's all right. It's all right. They're cool, you're all cool. Mm -hmm. We're cool. Yeah. Hey man, you got some kind of problem, man? Huh? You told me he would come. What the he hell's your problem, me. man? What's the matter with you? He told me you'd come. We all whacked out, man. <laughs> Get back, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think I'll just find somebody else. <laughs> We can introduce some fear to the guy too. Uh, just let him know that I know what's up, so I can go. Hey, buddy, I saw you looking at me. Uh, were you in cell block you, six, uh, county jail? Uh, I don't believe so, man. No. Oh. No, I don't know you from there. You look familiar. Have you been to the joint before? Uh, a couple times, but not in this state, man. All right. All right. Maybe we'll see each other over there sometime. All right, man. Not tonight, I hope. Right. You got it. Yeah. Okay. See you later. To lead untrained people into war is to throw them away. The adrenal stress effects are primarily these. One, auditory exclusion. Cops even say, I don't know, I don't know how many shots I fired. I didn't hear the gun go off. Only felt it buck in my hand. That's auditory exclusion. Two, loss of motor control. Even good martial artists look fine sparring or even in full contact matches. When a guy comes up to them and says, what the fuck are you looking at, motherfucker? I used to fuck guys like you in prison. Pow! Well, all those fine motor skills and all that martial arts training are not available to them because they've lost fine motor control with their first confrontation with stand-up aggression. You know, there are guys in the penitentiary that does their martial arts. They may even get into a confrontation, and they get them doing a little woo, and they get hit, they get the high, pow, they out. What? It's over. The fight is over. He done. His martial arts didn't pay off. They are flushed with adrenaline, and they can't control their muscles and can't use, that is, have no access to their martial techniques, even though they've studied them for years many times. 
because we've never studied them or practiced them under true adrenal stress. If you can't really take that punch or can't or get hit pretty hard and you fall off your game plan, regardless of jujitsu, kung fu, more, you you done. The third is tunnel vision. Guy pulls a knife out on you in that street. That's the only thing you see. You tunnel into that knife. It becomes the biggest thing in the world and the biggest knife you ever saw. That can get you killed. You may be skilled, you might get this one, but what about this one? What about that one? Can't get everybody, but you'll get got. The garden angels used to get got a lot. I've been involved in the martial arts since I was five years old. And I have a few black belts of my own. But that doesn't mean anything anymore. There are a lot of five-year-olds running around with their black belt. There are two things I know for sure. There are no secrets. I've never met anyone who can shoot lightning bolts through their fingertips. And I've never met anyone who can be taken out. Anyone can lose any time. What's important about training is to be able to handle adrenaline. If you don't know how to handle adrenaline, you're going to freeze or you're going to lose control in an actual confrontation. That's when we learn adrenal stress conditioning. The best training for an event is the event itself. If you're not preparing them for that adrenal rush, you're just sending them out to die. It, it's a, like that person who always throws the free throws in practice. When it comes to game time situation, chokes. And so you don't want to choke when someone's trying to victimize you. Get the fuck out of here. I come here all the time, man. This is my place. Get the fuck out of here. I'm here with my friends. Get you know the that? fuck out of here, man. Get the fuck out of here. One key element of training is to, is to really deal with that adrenaline, to understand it, and to put yourself in a situation where you're used to dealing with it. Because once it becomes dominant behavior, right then it right doesn't matter how much anxiety is there, uh, you're still going to you know, come back to and, and be able to deal with someone victimizing you in that situation. And this is why any real self-defense training must train you for that adrenal response. Tunnel vision, auditory exclusion, loss of motor control. You have to learn to use motor control, gross motor skills, under adrenal stress to be trained to effectively defend yourself. The best way to learn how to handle adrenaline is to actually go out and get in a few fights. But you don't want to do that. The next best thing is armored assailant training, where an instructor wearing state-of-the-art armor actually attacks you and gets the adrenaline going. The next best thing is to use Thai kickboxing pads to emulate the armored assailant. If you don't have access to anything and you don't want to get physical, you can still get real good results by actually having somebody get in your face and insult you. So you can practice everything that we talked about. Do you understand English? Don't come any closer, man. You don't want to do that. What are you smiling at? Because you, you We don't fight. like fucking foreigners Who's smiling we? in our bar. Oh, yeah? Me and all these people back here. Okay. The ones that are staring at your foreign dark ass. Okay, so just stay over there and I'll stay over here. Why don't you get the fuck out of here? I don't think huh? so. We don't like your kind here. No. We don't like them. So what? Read my fucking lips. We hey. don't like you. Why don't you read my lips? I'm done talking. Where do you want to go with this? Let's go straight over there. I'm done. Are you done? You better get your ass out of here. I don't think so. I'm not warning you again. Don't uh, make me come over here again. See you. It's better than nothing. You don't want to learn when the moment of truth comes. You want to learn before it happens. Do not hit at all if it can be avoided, but never hit softly. When it's time to defend yourself, you must have the proper combat mindset. Doesn't mean that you're not scared. It just means that you refuse to be a victim and you do whatever it takes to prevail. Nobody ever explained that better than the one and only Bruce Lee. Forget about winning and losing. Forget about pride and pain. Let your opponent graze your skin and you smash into his flesh. Let him smash into your flesh and you fracture his bones. Let him fracture your bones and you take his life. Do not be concerned with your escaping safely. Lay your life before him. Now, that's combat mindset in a nutshell. If you watch too many movies, here's how a fight starts. I hope you don't believe in that. If you're dumb and stupid, here's what you're gonna do. 
I hope you don't do that. I'll show you why. Because from this position, you're totally vulnerable. Whoever hits first from here is probably going to win. If you listen to everything I said, it's going to start from here. From this position, either he charges me or he walks away. When you see a rattlesnake poised to strike, you do not wait until he has struck before you crush him. It's all about how you present yourself, you know what I'm saying? You can tell him, hey, look, I, I, I ain't for that. And start walking off, he keep pursuing you, let him know, look, I ain't for that. And if you, if you got a person that's keep pursuing you, don't keep trying to talk to him, you're gonna have to move first. It'll either be, either he'll move first, either he, eventually he gonna get fed up with you keep walking away. So he gonna try to do something. So you have to start planning from that moment. If he stop me again, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna stay here and talk about him, tell him I ain't, I ain't with it, or am I gonna defend myself? You know, sometimes, you know what I'm saying, you, you moving first may save your life. So from here, you're not gonna wait until he hits you. Because usually whoever hits first wins. So if he comes any closer, you meet him halfway. You can preempt his attack legally because you're in fear of your safety. Can I throw a preemptive strike? The guy gets in my face and I go, hey, buddy, I don't want any trouble. Stay back. If you come in, I'm going to think you're going to hit me. Just stay back. Yeah. And now at that point, you've set the groundwork because you've said, look, look, I'm assuming, bud, that you've got blood in your, in your, in your eyes here and that you're going to take a piece of me. So why don't you just back off and, and, and leave me alone? So you've, you've set the parameters. You've said back off because my assumption is if you come any, any closer, your intent is to harm me and the guy comes close. The only defense is offense, which means that you have to kill more women and children more quickly than the enemy if you wish to save yourselves. Continuous attack means only one thing. There is only one way, which is your way. Once you hit the guy, you're not gonna let him recover from the first strike and you're gonna keep attacking and attacking until he's no longer a threat to you. The bottom line is, no matter what happens, whether he tries to punch you or take you down, you're going to keep your continuous attack. There is no back and forth exchange. You take over the situation and you keep attacking and attacking. This is not a boxing match where people are just squaring off and going back and forth. That's not the way it happens. You're taking over the situation. Remember, only one way, your way. If you preempt his attack, you can start by hitting the face. Either close fisted or open hand. Maybe that's going to take me down. But if it doesn't, he hits me in the face, that drives me back, hits me in the groin. Because I can't protect my face and my groin at the same time. He hits me on the groin, that bends my head over. He can either kick me or knee me from here. Boom. Boom. Best case scenario, he comes straight forward, puts a knee in the stomach, and finishes. Maybe that's over, but sometimes the guy hits the ground, he tries to get up this way. If I try to get up, boom, that's gonna take me down. Or I might try to get up on all fours. Boom, there I go again. That's the best case scenario, but usually it doesn't happen like that. A lot of things can go wrong, and we'll cover them now. I'm gonna show you different martial arts techniques now. That's just my personal opinion of what I think works in the street. So don't worry about the moves and the techniques. Keep in mind, continuous attack, and at the end of each segment, I'll show you where those martial arts moves come from, so you can seek professional instruction if you choose to. What I just showed you is just plain boxing. But keep one thing in mind. You don't wear gloves in the streets. And I can tell you from experience, if you punch somebody in the head, you're probably gonna break your knuckles. 
which I have several times. So open hand is your choice. <laughs> Elbows are devastating. The best thing about elbows is that you don't really have to worry about breaking your knuckles. If you want to learn more about throwing proper elbow strikes, the best art to seek is Thai kickboxing. Most guys have a problem hitting another guy in the balls. I just have one question for you. Why? And if you want to learn more about that, talk to my sister. Once the head comes down, you gotta switch from hands to kicks and knees. The best art for that, in my opinion, is Thai kickboxing. So you had a problem hitting somebody on the groin. I hope you got over that. The other problem is hitting somebody on the ground. Just because someone is down doesn't mean that they're out. So you gotta still make sure you remove the threat. Whether someone is unconscious or debilitated may be necessary in order to remove the threat. If your strikes are not working, you can still take the guy down with different techniques. First technique I'm gonna show you is from judo. The second one is just playing wrestling. Keep in mind, there are no mats in the streets, so be careful. Sometimes you both might hit the ground. If that happens, you want to make sure you end up in a superior position. So your attacker can keep jumping from the frying pan into the fire. The best art for that is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm going to show you two ways to avoid the punch. The first one is absorbing it. Second one is slipping. Keep one thing in mind. If you're wearing gloves, you can afford to do that. But in the street, you have no gloves, so you're gonna use your whole arm to block it. You gotta be ready to avoid takedowns at all times. The best way to learn that is to take freestyle wrestling. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to avoid takedowns and you're gonna end up on your back. From there, I recommend that you reverse the position and get up. But there are ways you can fight from your back. The best art to learn how to reverse a position and how to fight from your back is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu.
Legally, you're better off if you restrain your attacker instead of striking him. It takes more skill, and the best art I recommend for that is Hapkido. More specifically, combat Hapkido. The fight is over when your opponent is either physically or psychologically defeated, or somebody breaks it up. At that point, you need to turn off the switch. Control yourself. The fight is over at the point where you, have, as the victim, have somehow or another dissipated the threat so that the person is no longer a threat to you. Then legally, the fight better be over. Because if you continue beyond there, you lose your status as a victim. Self-defense is no longer an option to you. You become the aggressor. So the fight's over when you've removed the threat. Any confrontation can end in homicide. Unlike the movies, real life fighting has real life consequences. You are presented with a confrontation and it is the police officer's or prosecutor's belief that you were the initial aggressor. You can be charged with anything from disturbing the peace at its most simple level all the way up to, depending on the consequences of your action and the harm suffered by the person that you may have struck, all the way up to murder. I am no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and in the jury system. That is no ideal to me. It's a living, working reality. Gentlemen, a court is no better than each man of you sitting before me on this jury. A court is only as sound as its jury, and a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. I've learned the hard way about the realities of the legal system, and I guarantee you don't want to engage in a fight with a machine with unlimited resources. It takes a lot of financial and emotional strength. So pay attention to this next segment. And from now on, I don't know nothing. The legal process works when it comes to the prosecution of a criminal matter. It works in the following way. Number one, there's an investigation that's done on the street, as it were, by a police officer or a detective who's charged with the duty of gathering facts and information. From your testimony, or your statements to me, as well as uh, the witnesses, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to find a consistent uh, picture of what occurred so that I can make any decisions that I need to make regarding this. After the incident, I'll immediately uh, go in and, and uh, author my police report. In theory, they're supposed to then carry that information to the prosecuting attorney's office. Uh, I will discuss the merits of the case with the prosecutor and they will determine whether or not any charges will be issued or not. If they decide to charge you, then a complaint is filed in the court or it could be an indictment that would be returned, but there's information that's then filed with the court that would reflect the charge that they believe is appropriate under the circumstances. From there, you're in full-fledged prosecution. And once the charges have been filed, you'll be booked, you'll be arraigned before a judge, bond will be set, once bond is set, you can make bond, or you might be released on your recognizance, depending upon the seriousness of the offense. Once you've been arraigned and released, then you proceed either to a grand jury or to a preliminary hearing. Then you move on to a trial docket. And someday, quite often, five, six, seven months down the road, you'll find yourself in front of a jury defending yourself for actions uh, that, uh, that you are accused of having committed. If I testify in trial, my information always comes from my police report and the documents that I presented to the prosecutor. Huh, sounds like the police report is pretty important. Remember, the prosecutor's not interested in justice. That is not his department. He's paid to prosecute cases. So he prosecutes the cases that he has the best chance of getting a conviction in. The good lawyer is not the man who has an eye to every side and angle of contingency and qualifies all his qualifications but who throws himself on your part so heartily that he can get you out of a scrape. How you present yourself to law enforcement is a very, very important part of the formula. Once you've been involved in a confrontation, once you've been involved in a fight, and the police have been called, there's usually going to be some delay time. 
Now, depending on where they were called in the process, that may range from a few seconds to several minutes. During that time, you need to collect your thoughts. And the first thing you need to do is find out who saw what happened. Find out names. Grab a pad from the bar. Grab a pen. Write down names. Ask for phone numbers. Tell people not to leave. And when the police come, the first statement that one ought to make is, it was self-defense. Thanks for coming, officer. It's like those two guys attacked me. It was self-defense. I told them to stop. Secondly, be prepared to identify people in the room who witnessed what occurred. I mean, all those people here saw it. I got, I got everybody's name. So independent witnesses are the best tool you have in uh, displaying a reasonable situation to a police officer. Two guys over there, they just started messing with the guy over here. He got up, put his hands up, said he didn't want to fight. He was trying to back down and just, you know, be mature about it. And, um, he was threatened. He was trying to avoid the whole thing. He stood up and said, you know, I'm here trying to have a good time. I, I don't want a part of this. They were trouble as soon as they walked in. But make sure you're there armed with information because your best defense is going to be in those next few minutes when the police come. Remember, they have a lot of discretion as to whether or not someone gets charged or whether they don't get charged. If you're able to make a convincing case at the point where they arrive as to what happened and why you are the victim in this matter, you may avoid prosecution. You may avoid spending a lot of money and a lot of personal turmoil. But you find yourself in a confrontation in a public place, whether it's a restaurant or a bar or something like that, you may run into the dilemma that's posed by a bouncer. One of the first things these, these restaurants or bars is going to try and do is get you out of there. They don't want you in there because, frankly, it threatens their, their liquor license in the event that they have problems in the bar. It can, it can affect their ongoing business. They don't want you there. They're going to push you out into the street. What happens when you find yourself out in the street? The doors have been closed behind you, and it's just you and the aggressor in the street. What do you do? Don't follow the attacker where he wants to go, because you have no idea what he has waiting in life for you. He might have friends outside. He might have weapons outside. You stay in a very public area, in a public place where you know there are going to be witnesses uh, that will be impartial and be able to tell exactly what happened. Wait until the police come. Make the police report. It'll protect you from both criminal prosecution and a civil suit. People should avoid saying anything that, that uh, infringes on their Fifth Amendment rights. Once you find yourself in a confrontation and the police have arrived, and you've indicated to them that you've acted in self-defense, and you've given them the names of the witnesses, if that's the case, you should be careful not to say anything more without first seeking the advice of counsel. I would like to press charges. They attacked me. I told them to stop. You, you should always tell the officer that you intend to cooperate in the case and intend to prosecute. In the event that you find yourself a victim in a confrontation, you should stay and wait for the police, and you should always press charges. Uh, I think I'm hurt, and I, I don't know if the guy hit me or something, but I would like an ambulance, please. If you are indeed hurt, it, it, does, it does help, um, because uh, that is a right you have to ask the police for... Um, medical assistance if you do indeed need it, and it, uh, it also uh, helps bolster uh, your, your case that you were attacked. In a situation where I can't determine who the primary combatant is, both subjects are going to be placed under arrest and booked for the charge of assault. At that point, you should make no further statements. You should seek counsel, and you should take the protection that the Fifth Amendment gives you and say nothing else to the police. Say, sir, you're under arrest for assault third degree. Uh, I'm going to place you in handcuffs and uh, I'm going to take you to the station. At this time, I would suggest that you comply with the officer's uh, commands and do exactly as he tells you. In that manner, it would uh, place you in a better light as, as to being cooperative in the entire situation. Don't be dumb and resist arrest. I guarantee you don't want to be enlightened. And sir, I'm going to tell you, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed at no cost to you. Do you understand these rights? Yes, sir. Okay, sir, in a situation like this, I strongly suggest you exercise those rights. The next thing you must do is find a lawyer. A good case for me is a case where my client has brought me the names of witnesses and has done everything that I've described. They've made the police aware of the fact that it's self-defense, and they've given the police all the information that they can give the police in terms of witnesses. Because when that police report comes to me, that police report is going to reflect all this information. 
A good case for the prosecutor is a case where there are no witnesses other than the friends of the supposed victim. In that situation, the prosecutor is going to have all the cards and all the information. That becomes a case where you as the defense lawyer, your best hope is to merely shake the stories and look for inconsistencies. I would much prefer a case where I am able to actually put my own witnesses on who can say, this is what we saw and your client was not at fault. In the event that you do everything right, in the event that you have protected yourself as best you could, if you followed all the advice that I've given you, you may still find yourself in a situation where after a jury's considered what you've done, they may still find that you have violated the law. And so a reasonable outcome of that is, if you are convicted after a jury trial, is that you're going to go to the penitentiary. So keep these things in mind. Your best protection from hearing those doors shut behind you are to make sure, to make sure that you protect yourself, not just physically, but legally. The strong must feed on any prey at hand. You were branded to be a beast and set at the feast, even before you were a man. Dying is what's easy, but living around the ones you trust is what's hard. There is no such thing as being untouched in a penitentiary. You will be touched, whether it's physically or mentally, you'll be touched. I told you to de-escalate, didn't I? Now you gotta go play with the big boys. Most of the gangs run the penitentiaries. I'm being honest here with you. Most of the gangs run the penitentiaries, so they send scouts down to see if one an enemy has came in or a potential victim. Once you come in there, once you come in there, uh, you are the one that they will target the most. Be point one, your first, your first time in there, so you don't know everything that's going on. Point two, if you look good, you got problems because this guy's just looking for a honey. Point three, guys will offer you different things by you being new coming through the door. And you might say, okay, well, this might be a friend or something, so you're going to accept these things. That's your first mistake, because whatever you accept, if you're, not, if you're not able to pay it back, you have to pay it back one of two ways, either sucking some dick or getting fucked in your ass. If you fight them, they're eventually going to get what they want. If they come five, six deep, if they want the booty, they're eventually going to get the booty. Also, coming through the door, being new, you get no props. You get no phone. You get no phone. You might eat. That's only if you go to protective custody, but even in protective custody, there are guys that's trying to get back in population that will do something to you so they can get kicked out of protective custody, get back to population. It's all one big circle. If I only get one point across to you, I hope it's this one. Real fighting in the real world among adults always has the potential for homicide. In any case, it's going to mean severe legal problems or severe medical problems, or maybe put you in the morgue. It's a no-win situation. The only fight you can win is the one that you avoid, and that is the true art. I really haven't had anything pleasant to say so far, but violence is not pleasant. So preparing to defend against violence shouldn't be pleasant either. Maybe I made some martial arts instructors out there mad by taking the fantasy out of martial arts. But if your heart is in the right place, you can use this information to help all the vulnerable people that come to you for guidance. And for the charlatans out there, I hope I pissed you off. Maybe I'll make some prosecutors mad by educating people about the legal system. But the legal system belongs to the people, doesn't it? If you're a bully and you've been victimizing people, maybe I put a mirror to your face. But you needed that. But if I helped you to no longer be a victim, I'm happy. Because for that, I'm willing to live and die for. See you. You're weak now. You have been wounded. Remove yourself from the battlefield. Locate your wounds and treat them properly. You did not know your armor was full of holes. Repair the armor and make it stronger and stealthier. Without warning, Remove all the vermin that are feeding on your wounds. Turn into an eagle and carefully fly over the battlefield in silence. Do not be angry about the information you will acquire. It is not time to engage in combat or carry the wounded. Your sword is dull and your skills are limited. You are scared and alone now. Your enemies are searching for you. 
Be careful where you seek shelter. Sharpen your sword and develop your skills. Do not aim the sword at the rocks. Become the snake and crawl under them. Be aware of the snake. Let the monkey confuse and expose his enemies. Let the eagle monitor the battlefield. Let the dragon turn his fire in the right direction. Let the tiger stalk and kill his enemies without mercy or anger. Unknown powers will be added to your arsenal. You will know that the war cannot be won. Both parties will try to recruit you. You'll be scared, but you no longer have the option to run. The war is being fought on many interconnected levels. Accept your status and your mission will be revealed. Follow the path by living, loving, killing and dying like a warrior. You cannot fight alone. Gather your armies and re-enter the battlefield. This is the way of the warrior. That's a wrap.